Um, it's good to see everybody here this afternoon. Uh, I'm Brian Pennington. I'm the director of Elon Center for the Study of Religion, Culture, and Society. And I'd like to welcome you here this afternoon for this panel discussion on religious liberty and marriage equality. I'd like to begin by recognizing Joel Harder and thanking him for the efforts in putting this together. Joel's not sitting up here, but this is his, this is his idea. This is his uh, conception of how to address these issues for the campus, and we're grateful to him for pulling this together. So thanks, Joel. So we're just going to take an hour or so tonight, and the format is going to work something like this. Uh, I will introduce each of our panelists, um, one after the other. I'll give a brief biography of who they are and, and why they have authority to speak to these issues, and then I'll ask them to just to say whatever they feel is necessary and appropriate with respect to the questions of liberty and, and equality here from the, from the perspectives of their own expertise. Uh, so each one will take five or seven minutes to talk about these things, and then there'll be time for question and answer, answer and discussion among the panelists, all right? Sound good? Great. So first of all, we have Enrique Armijo. Uh, Dr. Armijo is Associate Professor of Law and an Affiliate Fellow of the Yale Law School Information Society Project. He teaches and researches in the areas of First Amendment, constitutional law, torts, administrative law, media and internet law, and international freedom of expression. Professor Armijo's current scholarship addresses the interaction between new technologies and free speech. His scholarly work has recently appeared in the North Carolina Law Review, the Cardozo Arts and Entertainment Law Journal, the Fordham Urban Law Journal, Communication Law and Policy, and other places. We're very grateful to have uh, Professor Armijo here. Thank you. Well, thank you all for thank you all for coming. It is so uh, great for me to be uh, a part of this space being used for one of the reasons it was intended and that, that's to talk about issues like this. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we got to this point with respect to same-sex marriage. Um, the collision that some see between the consequences of the Supreme Court's Obergefell decision and, and religious freedom issues, and you know, the latter part of this will obviously touch on Ms. Davis from Kentucky, who I'm not sure we could get through the evening without talking about in some way. So let me do some law. And the undergraduates, this will either confirm a thought that you think you might want to go to law school or confirm the fact that you never want to come <laughs> close to a law school. Uh, just in terms of how we got here. The very short version of this is that uh, the due process clause of the United States Constitution obliges the government to treat everyone equally with respect to certain fundamental rights. So the trick, as I tell my constitutional law students, is what is the right at issue? How is the right at issue in a particular controversy between an individual and the government defined? So back in the 1980s, there was a man named Michael Harwick. Uh, he's arrested for violating the Georgia sodomy statute for having intimate relations with his male partner. And how the police got into his home is a whole different issue that we can talk about that's very interesting. We probably won't. But he challenges this law as violating the due process clause because he says that it violates his right to have intimate relations with the person of his choice. And that, when you define the, the right in that way, it connects to a long line of cases that the Supreme Court has decided with respect to what fundamental rights the Constitution recognizes. So cases that you probably have already heard about, rights protecting the right to contraception, uh, right, uh, rights related to uh, being able to marry people of different races and striking down those type of laws uh, in the 50s and 60s. But the Supreme Court uh, in the case Bowers versus Hardwick says no. The right at issue here is the right to homosexual sodomy. And when you define the right that narrowly, it does not fall within this tradition of fundamental rights that have been recognized in the past. So you fast forward to 2003, a decision written by Justice Kennedy who we will hear from again, um, who we heard from again this summer, in a case called Lawrence versus Texas. More or less the exact same facts, um, or at least issues, uh, before the court as were in Bowers, and Kennedy, in a five to four opinion, so that's a, as narrow opinion as can get, at the Supreme Court says no. The right here is, as Michael Hardwick described it back in the 80s, it's the right to have intimate relations with the person of your choice. 
And that is a fundamental right entirely consistent with the rights that we've recognized in the past that's protected by the Due Process Clause. So it's not a right that the government can discriminate as to, uh, as to whether or not the relation at issue is uh, same sex or opposite sex. So once you have Lawrence, um, it's a very short step to conclude that the Due Process Clause protects the right to same-sex marriage, as was the case um, in Obergfell uh, at the beginning of the summer, which was another 5-4 to four opinion, which was also written by Justice Kennedy. So that's the law. So the next step is what this means. What does this case mean going forward? Um, I think it's easier, though, to think through about what it doesn't mean. Um, and this, this touches to some of the religious uh, equality issues that we're here to talk about tonight. I, I think it's important uh, to, to, to keep in your mind uh, the two separate definitions of marriage. Uh, one is a religious union, and that's defined by a, uh, particular churches, particular denominations, um, as distinct from civic marriage, which is, uh, has requirements that are imposed by state law. And, and, and the discussion of this issue has blurred those two somewhat. I think Randy may talk about how they're not quite as distinct as, as I just laid it out when he talks about um, the UCC's challenge to Amendment 1. But the, 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 the religious marriage, the institution of religious marriage, um, shouldn't really change after the Obergfell decision. So if you have um, two, uh, a Jewish couple who wants to be married, they can't use the First Amendment to force a Catholic priest to marry them if that Catholic priest's beliefs and, 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 and the, 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 the beliefs by which he practices say that that is not a marriage that he can perform or that is not a marriage that his religion recognizes. Uh, the Obergfell decision has nothing to do with that. But what it has a lot to do with is the concept of civic marriage. And that's what brings us to Mrs. Davis and, and to Rowan County, Kentucky. So her best argument, I'm going to make her best argument. I don't think that we've heard her best argument, certainly not in the media, certainly not on Twitter. But, but Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Davis, is, Kim Davis's best argument, I think, goes like this. She's a member of a denomination or of a church. I think she's an apostolic Christian. Um, so she, her church or her denomination defines marriage as between a man and a woman. And, and she thinks that anything um, that she does to facilitate that or anything that she does as being complicit in that um, is a sin, the same way that the marriage um, between two same-sex partners is also a sin. So, so it's her belief that her, her belief is that her religion prevents her from doing that. And by extension, it prevents, prevents her from doing anything in her official capacity that would ratify that union or to, in any way to help that union to happen because that would be a sin the same way that the union is a sin, at least in the eyes of her church. But the, the, the problem, I think, um, for, for Mrs. Davis is that you know, she has the constitutional right to believe that, certainly. But she doesn't have the, right, the constitutional right to be a county clerk. And if you are a county clerk, you are bound by the definition of marriage that is set out by the United States uh, Supreme Court in terms of what kinds of marriages are legal. And if that's the case, and if any law that Kentucky may have had in its constitution or in its statutes, or both, that define marriage as between a man and a woman is now invalid because, as the Supreme Court said in, in June, those laws violate the due process clause of people who seek to enter into those unions. Then, uh, Ms. Davis has a few choices. She can either let uh, her deputy clerks in her office sign off on those, on those marriage licenses and register those licenses, which I believe is what's happening now, um, or she can quit. And, and then the risk of permitting um, uh, Kim Davis or anyone with a religious objection um, to exercise, to act on that belief in an official capacity is that you make the religion of that person, the law of the state or the county in which they are exercising their official duties. So that's the real danger here. And, and, and that's why I think you know, the courts in Kentucky have rightly said, uh, these marriages need to go forward. That's what the law says. And you know, in, here in North Carolina, um, we had a number of magistrates um, after Amendment 1 was struck down by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals 
um, which is the court just below the Supreme Court, said that Amendment 1 violated the Due Process Clause. We had, I think, between six and ten magistrates just resign. They said, I, this is inconsistent with my beliefs. I am not going to perform marriages. If I have to perform these kinds of marriages, I'm not going to perform marriages anymore. So that's an option for Ms. Davis. That's an option for all of these um, follow-on cases that I think we'll hear about after, after Kim Davis, uh, people who have religious objections um, to, to, uh, to same-sex marriage, uh, objections that are bona fide, that I think are deser deserving of respect, but not objections that, we, that I think should get in the way of the state's um, issuance of its obligations under state law with respect to same-sex marriages. Next, we have Reverend Randy Orwig. Uh, Reverend Orwig is senior pastor of the Elon Community Church across the street, a place you might know better as an occasional uh, gathering of dogs happens there. Uh, he served uh, Methodist churches in the state of Ohio and uh, apparently had a change of heart when he became a United uh, Minister in the United Church of Christ and served congregations in Virginia, Missouri, and now in North Carolina. Reverend Orwig is here not only because he's an important community leader, but it is his church, his denomination, the United Church of Christ, which sued successfully in the state of North Carolina to have the uh, amendment to the Constitution that, that effectively banned same-sex marriage in the state overturned. So Reverend Orwig, thank you for being here, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Well, I'm not going to speak as an attorney today, although at the United Church of Christ, it, from its polity, its formation, is a, is a little different than what you might see in, in some other denominations. We have different settings in the church. We have local churches, then we have uh, associations and conferences, and then we have a national setting of the church. Each one can work kind of independently of each other. Uh, they, they work what we call in covenant with each other. And it was the national setting of the church that actually um, decided to sue the state of North Carolina uh, around the issue of religious freedom. And it's a little different than what you would think because usually when you hear people saying for religious freedom, they don't want to do something. Uh, well, for our expression of religious freedom, we wanted to do something and we weren't able to do it. And that was to be able to perform same-sex marriages. Uh, we had not every single one of our UCC pastors, but many of our UCC pastors were feeling that, they, that their ability to share in that, uh, in that kind of a marriage service was curtailed. There were also some uh, interesting, uh, and again, you might speak to it a little differently, but this was, was our perception, was that uh, there was some legal ideas that if we performed a marriage without a marriage license, that we could actually be sued um, that we, so in other words, let's say an older couple who uh, has been married before and they have their social security and they have all of their pensions and their benefits. Uh, we've had some come to us and say, we really can't afford to get married, but we'd like to be together under some kind of religious identity. And so we'd like to have a blessing. And, uh, and it was, and some of us started to feel that that was a limitation on our part, that we couldn't do that. In fact, there were some pastors that felt even if they were to bless a same-sex couple, even though they were not being legally married, they might have been legally married in another state, that they felt that they could also be sued as well. So within this framework, there was a sense that we had an opening, and that was that we wanted to be able to share our religious practices as openly as others. And so that's when the lawsuit came down. Uh, it was uh, against Roy Cooper, the, the uh, Attorney General of North Carolina. And, uh, uh, and when this, they actually tabled this, waiting for the, the Supreme Court decision. And uh, so when this all started to, to hit, when the appeals started to hit, um, the, uh, in Asheville, the judge in Asheville pulled out our lawsuit and let it go. And, and that was uh, a, a big moment for us. And uh, so we started, we had pastors who were at uh, some of the, uh, the courthouses where they were getting licenses and they were doing weddings. Uh, and that was, was a big deal for us. So that was a, it was a great moment. Um, now, to say that we are forced or required as United Church of Christ pastors to do weddings is, not, is untrue. 
Um, we, are, we only do it by choice, and a church can decide as a congregation whether they will hold same-sex marriages in their, in their churches. And that is still a reality. Most churches have to, to comply with their own church polity and their own church values, and a government cannot coerce them to do any different. Nor can a couple come in and say, we want to get married, and if they say no, I have the right to say no to anybody for any reason. Um, and that's uh, because some pastors want to do premarital counseling, and then they decide if the people they feel it, that they're good, they feel good about doing the wedding. So there's a lot of of, of criteria that goes into that those decisions that uh, a lot of people don't think about, but pastors feel that they have the right to be able to make that decision, and under the law they do. So um, unfortunately, uh, I think that the church can discriminate in many, many ways, uh, through a lot of different variables, but one of them is through, through marriage. Now, when I do a wedding service, I am working with that couple. There is a, a, a license that I am able to sign for solemnizing the marriage. In other words, the, uh, the, all the law t- stuff is taken care of when, before that license gets to me. But then there's two other places for, the, uh, for two witnesses to, to uh, document that there was a wedding. Those are the people who are included in a wedding. Nobody else is. Everyone else is considered an observer. Everyone else is considered there to support or whatever for the wedding, but they are not participating in the wedding. That's why it has always been very unsettling to me when I hear cake makers and photographers and these other folks who say, I won't participate in that wedding. They aren't participating in the wedding. They cannot participate in the wedding. That is not what's happening there. So uh, other than those two witnesses, the pastor or an officiant, and the couple, no one else is actually officially required to be there. And, and, and they will be married whether they're there or not. So I want you to hear that because that's an important thing for us as pastors to know and to appreciate because we have to put up with photographers and cake makers and all those people. (laughs) So, uh, and, and I've been at weddings where, uh, and, and I, I'm maybe a little bit more loose than some other pastors. I've always told the couple, whatever you feel comfortable with, but I actually did a wedding one time where the photographer was literally standing over their fingers, taking a picture while they're putting the ring on. And it was like, it was a little weird, but, you know, I thought, well, if this couple really thinks that's what they want, that's great. But uh, most pastors would say, you know, they can stay at a distance or they can do this. So just remember that there's no one else participating in this wedding but, but, but us. And, and so when it comes to religious freedom, I have the ability to say to a couple that, yes, I will marry you. And I'm very pleased to have that privilege. Now, as a pastor, uh, in, in, the, in a church who has a church building, one of the things that has been happening that we see as a challenge right now is that we have a bunch of wonderful pictures of same-sex couples getting married. And we see trees in the background, and we see fountains and parks and everything else, and we say, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture is they're not in a church. You know, from a pastor's perspective, I want them to feel that, th- that our church building is a welcoming place and that they can come and be at, you know, in front of the altar or uh, in, in a sanctuary to be able to have that wedding. So our job now, since we are an open and affirming congregation, is to invite people to do that. But that's going to take some time because unfortunately the church has done a very good job of making sure that people are much more comfortable outside the church than they are inside the church especially if they're same-sex couples. And so, so we have a lot of unlearning to do and a lot of, uh, of things to do to help really encourage them to be uh, happy and comfortable within the church setting. One of the other issues that we deal with is that people who are same-sex, like everyone else, come from a lot of religious backgrounds. So they're welcome in our church, but they may not be comfortable with our form of worship. They may not be comfortable with the way we do things. They may not be what they grew up with. 
So they have to go through a, a time of assimilation or a time, if they choose to, to be able to be a part of that. And that's one of the challenges we face in the church, too, because we have folks that come from a lot of different backgrounds. We have one family where uh, a couple who come from a Pentecost holiness background, used to yelling amen and everything else, but they got kicked out of their church because their son was gay. And so they have found a way to become a part of our church and become very happy, but that's not always the case. So, so we have our challenges as well, but from a same-sex religious freedom point of view, we really are uh, on the road now, and we're really starting to build that relationship. So as a pastor, for me, this is the, a, a new beginning, and we're trying to make that, those steps. One last thing I want to say is that pastors are not officers of the state. However, we seem to be because we sign these licenses. And one other thing that uh, I had shared with him earlier is that we are also required by the state to do certain things. Like if I'm in a counseling situation and someone tells me something that uh, would involve murder or involve uh, potential suicide or would involve abuse of a child or something like that, I'm required by law to report that. Now, in a few states, there are some exceptions that if it's in a counseling, like a lawyer, you know, client privilege, but uh, North Carolina doesn't have that. We actually have to report. So in some ways, we do have some uh, obligations to the state, even though we are uh, free religiously. So some pastors could mistake this for that they could be sued by someone if they decided they didn't want to perform a same-sex marriage, but that is not the case and it is not true at all. So those are the things I wanted to share with you, but I really wanted just to share as a local church pastor in an open and affirming congregation, we are extremely excited about the potential for this, and we know that we have a long way to go. Dr. Lynn Huber is Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Elon. Her research focuses on the book of Revelation in the Christian New Testament and gendered interpretations of apocalyptic texts. She's the author of many articles and uh, pieces in biblical commentaries and has written two books, Thinking and Seeing with Women in Revelation uh, in 2013 and Like a Bride Adorned, Reading Metaphor in John's Apocalypse. And I'm not going to talk about the apocalypse, although I could, like if, you, if you're really interested. Um, but my research does focus on bridal and wedding imagery in the ancient world. Um, and I've also done um, quite a bit of work on gender and sexuality in the Bible and early Christianity, um, including an essay on sort of same-sex relations in the New Testament. Uh, so my comments are going to be sort of a, a different sort than um, our previous two speakers as they engage the biblical text primarily, since that's my area. And also because, um, as Enrique mentioned, um, Kim Davis, one of, her, one of her appeals, one of her explanations for her, um, not a legal explanation, but one of her justifications for her decision not to issue marriage licenses was based upon scripture in the Bible. And that becomes the sort of basis from which she makes her argument. And it's the basis for which a lot of Christians make their arguments for and against um, same-sex marriage. And so my job here is just to unpack some of, um, of that and maybe to give you a little mini, mini lesson on marriage in the New Testament and um, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, so there's just a couple things that I want you to kind of know about this. Um, and I do have notes because that's how I work. I'm, you know, a scholar. That's what we do is we write stuff. So first, I want to say the Bible offers an inconsistent view of marriage. Um, it's inconsistent because as those of you who are familiar with the Bible know, it's a collection of texts uh, from a variety of authors, um, including authors over a wide range of time who are shaped by their historical context, including, which includes assumptions about marriage. And so in the variety of the, of the biblical canon, Hebrew Bible and New Testament, we see a variety of relationships that we might label as marriage. And um, we, in, some of these include positive evaluations, um, for instance, of marriages that we might feel uncomfortable with today. Um, so the Hebrew Bible includes positive evaluations of men who took slaves as concubines. Abraham is probably um, 
one example, and men who had multiple wives. So Jacob having two wives and Solomon having 700 or something, which, you know, and wife is, is, is an interesting term. So um, in the biblical text and in the ancient world, these marriages, these sorts of relationships were considered appropriate, um, and culturally appropriate, um, desirable, actually, even though we, living in the 21st century, might see these as um, problematic or far from an ideal. So the issue here is that biblical texts present marriage um, shaped in ways that are shaped by their historical context and cultural practices. And the, it, when we look at the biblical text, we see that sort of marriage and expectations about marriage change over time. So in light of these examples, um, I think Christians who claim the Bible as a source of God's direction and guidance are really forced to ask which depictions or discussions of marriage in the biblical text are authoritative and which aren't. For the biblical image of marriage is more complicated than the sort of one man equals one woman, or one man plus one woman equals marriage, uh, which we often see on bumper stickers. So my second point, um, those who appeal to what they describe as a biblical view of marriage are often Christians who hold Jesus and his life as a model. And the gospel writers of the New Testament, the ones who sort of write about Jesus and his life, however, portray Jesus as relatively uninterested in marriage. Um, the gospel rec writers record one instance, which is recorded two times, um, in which Jesus offers an explicit teaching about marriage. Or maybe to be accurate, he offers an explicit teaching about divorce, um, right? And so in response to questioning, D Jesus teaches that divorce should happen only in the case of unchastity, a teaching that is disregarded by many today, I'd say, um, uh, and many within the church, right? And we're okay with that. Um, and I don't, <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with that. I think that's a good thing often. Um, and, but very few Christians, and, and very few Christians today take that text literally, right? Um, and they especially don't take literally Jesus' explanation that remarriage after divorce is adultery. Um, so the gospel writers, instead of like showing Jesus focused on marriage, show him focused on a variety of other things. Um, and in fact, I would argue, um, and this is sort of my third point, that the New Testament has a real ambivalence towards marriage and family. Um, it's not the ultimate good in it would be hard to say it was the ultimate good in any of the texts of the New Testament, for, in, in, for instance. Um, so this ambivalence, so a few words about that. Um, culturally and historically, we can imagine that Jesus' closest disciples, his closest friends and mates, are adult Jewish males who would have likely have been married. Um, families were eager to have sons marry. It was, it was part of what you did. Um, and it meant a set of hands um, to help the, the household income. In spite of this, and in spite of the social significance of marriage in the ancient world, Jesus calls his followers to follow him as he wanders throughout Galilee and Judea. And he effectively asks them to leave their families. We can imagine the 12 disciples leaving their wives and their children, leaving their livelihoods to go and follow this guy. Um, so pretty, I mean, it's a pretty radical image um, here. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, this sort of radical image of people following Jesus and sort of leaving their families. And there's a lot of rhetoric in the New Testament. I see Dr., uh, Professor Olson here, so I'm guessing some of you are in New Testament. If you look in sort of these texts, you see there's this radical language of discipleship and leaving the family and leaving sort of your obligations to follow Christ. Um, that... Um, shows a disregard for the family. It's also, interestingly, the sort of rhetoric that I think motivates someone like Kim Davis to do what she's doing, right? Um, to sort of be willing to give up her worldly connections and her obligations um, to her state, to her family, and maybe possibly a livelihood in order to practice civil disobedience. So it's interesting. That sort of model works in a variety of ways. Um, but Jesus shows little respect for sort of the family and for biological families, um, even defining family as those who follow God's commandments um, and rejecting sort of his biological family. The Apostle Paul, my favorite, um, and yeah, I hear some laughs. Most people don't, don't like him. I think he's kind of crazy, and I love that. Um, he's the author of most of the New Testament writings, 
And he offers the most explicit discussion of marriage in the New Testament in a letter that he sends to a community in a city called Corinth. Um, in, this mar in this letter, he says marriage is fine um, for those who can't manage to stay celibate, right? Or who can't manage to control their sexual desires. So marriage for Paul is a cop-out, right? It's like for those of you who are weak. And so... <laughs> Um, and he's kind of like, I'd rather have you be unmarried, and marriage causes problems, which, you know, I'm sure married people would agree that it probably is difficult, and you have other concerns. And so for Paul, marriage is not the ideal. Um, and that actually becomes, for early Christianity, um, sort of, I mean, that becomes an important thing. And actually for women, and uh, some argue for women in earliest Christianity, the option to not marry um, becomes a really, um, it becomes an option, right? Like if your option is, I mean, if you don't have an option, the option to, if you have to marry in your culture, the option to not marry becomes really attractive because it presents something else than what um, the dominant requires. But again, we have a really ambivalent sort of image of family and marriage in the New Testament, both in the person of Jesus and the person of Paul and in his instructions. So fourth, I'd say that the Bible, including both the um, Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, provides examples of a variety of loving relationships and fam familial configurations. Um, one of the most poignant images of faithful love in the Hebrew Bible tradition is Ruth's devotion to her mother-in-law, Naomi, um, in the book of Ruth. And some of you are probably familiar with the story. So just as Genesis uh, suggests that a man will leave his home and cling to his wife, so Ruth is described in this book as clinging to Naomi. Um, in a passage that is ironically um, often cited at weddings, uh, Ruth says to Naomi, quote, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my, um, my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. I don't think the buried part is often used in weddings, but maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Randy can um, confirm that that's a sort of popular passage, at least in weddings, um, you know, other sex weddings, um, even though it's showing sort of a woman's desire for a woman to whom she's not bio biologically related to. So to be sure, Ruth and Naomi are not necessarily described in the text as married, um, even though some would argue that the word cling implies that. Um, but their story brings into relief that there are sort of a variety of images in biblical traditions of how people relate romantically, um, familially, um, and that it's not all sort of defined by marriage. We see a lot of variety in the, New, in the New Testament as well, including a wonderfully poignant image of Jesus and his closest disciple, John, who is called his beloved. Um, so I guess, what does this mean? Um, I think a lot of this ha it has a number of implications. First, I would say, when you hear people appeal to biblical marriage, um, I, would, I would hope that you would pause and realize that there's not a single vision, right? Um, and you should ask, so which marriage are you talking about? Which, which image? Um, and that some, and I'd hope you realize that some visions of marriage in the biblical text don't align easily with contemporary perspectives on gender equality and justice. Um, and we often hear those kind of bandied around sort of in, I, I know there's uh, with uh, Kim Davis, there's a movement to put a billboard up in her neighborhood about like you wouldn't, um, I can't remember what it is, but you know, if you follow traditional marriage, um, you, um, you know, you'd have to sell your daughter for a goat or, so, or something like that. And I, I think actually that really makes light um, of biblical traditions and sort of the historical situa situatedness of marriage. Um, I personally don't find it really funny um, that, that we, we mock that, but, um, but I do think um, the, the text do um, reveal sort of this variety and that it is a very much a culturally shaped tradition. Um, so there's not a biblical marriage. Also, I'd say when you hear people appealing to biblical texts as a source of family values, um, you should be suspicious. Um, marriage and having children are not the aim of life in many of the biblical texts. They're not sort of the ultimate goal. Um, in fact, much of the New Testament challenges ideas about the importance of biological family and prompts audiences to care for those outside of, family, uh, outside of the biological family, specifically orphans and widows. So biblical texts often, especially in the tradition of the Hebrew Bible prophets, um, 
encourages an expansive view of family, of bringing people in in sort of new and different ways. Um, I would also say, sort of speaking of Jesus and Paul's resistance towards the culture of marriage, the biblical text should make us think about the privilege associated with marriage and the fact that marriage is often used to empower certain individuals and groups over others. Uh, For LGBTQ Christians, and I count myself in this group, um, it's important to examine whether we should so eagerly embrace an institution that has this history of... uh, sort of privileging one over the other. Um, And there are certain contexts in which people of certain races and classes um, have not been able to marry. Um, And it's because of issues of power and sort of the authorization of the state is something that, you know, gives it this sort of power. And I think we need to think seriously about how eagerly we embrace it. And especially as we have um, businesses trying to um, appeal to us and um, sort of co-opt us um, into the sort of economic system of weddings, which I think is really exploitative. Uh, One last thing, and this is kind of related to Kim Davis, not only does the Bible have sort of an ambivalent picture of marriage, it also has a really ambivalent understanding of how to relate to the state and how individuals should relate to the government. So in the New Testament, we see calls to honor the honor the governor, or yeah, the emperor, the governor, the government. Um, But on the other hand, we also see texts which imagine um, the defeat of imperial powers. So we have an ambivalent message there as well. And over time, Christians faithfully have engaged in the sort of civil disobedience that we see Mrs. Davis doing based upon religious beliefs. Um, So... And in fact, interestingly, like LGBTQ Christians have engaged in very similar sort of practices uh, of civil disobedience um, as well. So it's an interesting kind of conundrum. Thank you, Dr. Hebert. Finally, we have Matthew Antonio Bosch. Uh, Matthew Antonio has just completed two years as the director of the Gender and LGBTQIA Center, which he wants you to know is in Mosley 211. He has degrees from Cornell University and Harvard University. And before coming to Elon, he worked for 10 years uh, as the chief diversity officer at North Hennepin Community College and in its LGBTQ center. While at Elon, he has co-chaired uh, President Lambert's LGBTQIA task force. He, uh, along with Dr. Huber, are organizing the first ever Alamance County LGBTQIA Pride Festival, which they want you to know is on October the 10th. <laughs> That's a Saturday. And uh, he has helped lead Elon into national rankings as a top 25 LGBTQ-friendly university in the U.S. Thank you so much for having me. Um, For me, I'm all about what's next. What is, because marriage equality is one thing, but there's a whole lot more around LGBTQIA rights than just marriage, right? So let's discuss the tea. I'm all about the untold story. So some of the things that people don't necessarily know when they hear about marriage equality. The first one, many students do not care greatly about marriage equality. If you think of our students between the ages of 17 and 23, on their list of LGBTQIA topics, the fact that they can marry is not exactly the most immediate, right? Because for many of them, I mean, many, many folks are tr- still trying to discover who they truly are. Um, some are wondering which letter of the acronym in LGBTQA do I run to? Do I not even have a letter? Am I running from one to another? And the answer is, you don't need to run to any of them. But let alone deciding whom truly then you're going to marry to be a lifelong partner, not always in the mind of a 17 to 23 year old, um, particularly as they've got other things to do, like go to chemistry. <laughs> so with regards to different classes, um, different, different um, ways that people think about it, um, another piece that people might not know necessarily is that Indiana was just the one that got sort of the most publicity. There are 19 states that have religious freedom laws, right? Um, Arkansas for a bit was sort of on the, on the radar, um, but 19 states. And oftentimes, I think um, another thing people are, are, are maybe not as familiar with is that 
when we hear conversations of religious freedom, oftentimes it's in the media, which can sometimes paint a picture of it's this way or that way and nothing in between. And I think oftentimes, um, one important example from Minnesota, um, we have Amish people. Yes, we have Amish people in Minnesota. Many people are not as familiar about that. Um, but they had claimed a religious freedom clause because um, in on their buggies, many of them um, were, it is unlawful to not have um, lights. You know, it's dark at night. If you're utilizing your buggy for some reason at night and you're on, going on, you know, roads and streets, people have to see you. And so they said, well, there's no way we're gonna do electric lights. We have a religious exemption from the electricity. Um, and so what they did instead was to find silver reflective tape that would then go on the buggies and would pick up all the other electric lights, right? And so the idea around sort of religious freedom being one way or another, you're either with us or you're against us, is quite, is quite difficult um, for many people to think about. So thinking a bit broader about there are ways in which we can make accommodations to some folks um, without fully feeling, you know, in a way that truly honors their religion, but also gets the job done in terms of what really needs to be done for people's safety, ultimately. So that's, a, that's important for us to keep in mind. Aside from that, I think one piece, when we talk about places like in Indiana in particular, um, and even in, K in Kentucky as well, oftentimes what we don't see is the companies that say, well, we serve everyone. In fact, we're gonna put a sign on our store that says, we serve everyone. You oftentimes hear about the businesses, you, everyone in here knows something about a bakery that didn't like LGBTQIA people, right? But uh, does anyone know about the record store that put up, hey, we serve everyone? Does anyone know about that? Maybe not necessarily, because it depends on what gets picked up. So it's interesting to use this, um, this uh, incident, if you will, this instance, for other people to say, hey, I got a competitive advantage. As a business owner, I'll take all the dollars I want. So I'm gonna put a sign that says, we welcome everyone, we serve everyone. That's really, really important, but that's oftentimes not picked up. So when we're thinking about um, sort of the, the trade-offs, if you will, that's just, that's really important for folks to, to recognize. I think also too in North Carolina, because some people, um, some people have heard about some of the magistrates that have um, said, you know, I'm, I'm going to quit my job, et cetera. Um, there also is an exemption for six months. So if for some reason a magistrate um, feels that they cannot perform um, a same-sex marriage, um, they can opt out of six months. But another own told piece, people aren't as familiar, but you don't just exempt yourself from performing same-sex marriages. You exempt yourself from performing any marriages for six months. So suddenly magistrates who are a little worried about losing their job are like, hmm, let me rethink this. Um, and so we have to think a bit about sort of the all or nothing proposition. I think additionally, as we're looking past marriage equality, we're thinking about what are the big issues impacting LGBTQIA folks? We're thinking about things like job discrimination. You know, when you get married, it becomes public record. Anyone can go online and figure out who's married because it's public record, right? It's run by a state office. And so your employer at any moment, if they don't have a non-discrimination clause that protects you from sexual orientation, that that protects you uh, on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, you could get married on a Sunday, fired on a Monday. And oftentimes it's not, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have any legal recourse, um, but oftentimes, of course, you're not gonna go in on Monday morning and someone's gonna be like, I heard you got married, you're fired. Um, they oftentimes don't do that at that blatantly. It's oftentimes hidden under the guise of low productivity. We've noticed you've had low productivity. I have, I didn't know that. Well, we gotta let you go. Why? Oh, I got this ring finger. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's a tricky piece. And so if you were to come back and say, no, 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 I think it's because I'm a lesbian or I'm bisexual or I'm transgender, you would have no legal recourse. Luckily, I work at Elon. I think also too, we have to think about the disparate circumstances that impact specific areas. So we're thinking about things like homelessness, right? We already talked about job discrimination, things like employment, right? Um, violence. Violence is still a very real thing, in particular for our students, who oftentimes are coming out and afraid that maybe people from their hometown, maybe other folks in the community um, might view them differently in a way because they're not as familiar with um, some of the safety and some of the resources that we might have. Um, but even for adults too, violence is a real thing. Making sure everyone feels safe, validated, and respected. That's what we're trying for at all times. And I think in particular, what we're seeing in the media, um, particularly around transgender women of color, right, at extremely high rates of violence and murder. 
um, when we're looking at um, the, the issues that trans people have to face with regards to job discrimination, because people think a trans person isn't going to quite fit into our uh, company, and what happens when the person comes to the front desk and sees what they feel it might be a, a gender queer identified person, what do we do now? I'm so afraid that I don't know what pronouns to use that therefore, well, let's just skip this and not hire them. These are real issues and these are human beings, right? And so as we think a bit broader about some of the, those, um, those issues that really are impacting people in my community, as the LGBTQIA community, it's really troublesome to think about all of that. Um, one thing that I loved, um, we had a speaker last year named Eli Clare. One of the things that he said, and I loved it, was that when you think about the acronym, we're not drawn together in one LGBTQIA community because we're similar. It's not because we're so similar, right? Because if you're, if you're lesbian versus being trans, you're not exactly going for the same thing, right? You know, versus asexual, et cetera. But we're drawn together because of how we face discrimination. So think what it's like to be part of a community that is drawn together not because you're similar, but because of the type of discrimination you face based on gender and sexuality. That's a powerful reason for a community to, to build solidarity. And so now we have emerging identities. We have other ones beyond LGBTQA. We have pansexual, we have aromantic, we have demisexual, gray sexual, sapiosexual. Yes, lots of terms, lots of terms. We have genderqueer, we have non-binary, right? And so we're, we're, we're thinking more, um, more broadly about the terms that not necessarily I'm bringing to the table, but that our students, when we have 25% of our students turning over all the time, incoming first years are coming, bringing these terms, bringing these identities. Um, oftentimes we're relying on our students to teach us what's the newest language, um, what, what, are the, what are the emerging identities that we're seeing around gender and sexuality. So I think those are really important things to take hold of that are far outside the realm of marriage equality, right? And whether two people of, of the same gender can marry. Um, the only other piece I would say is, um, you know, my own personal experience, I was part of a gospel choir in, um, in college at Cornell University, and um, I was singing for six semesters in it, and I will never forget the time as a senior when the head of the choir came to me and said, we recognize you're a really big gay activist on campus, and we basically have to let you go. We don't feel you're saved enough. To, to sing in our choir. Now, if they had only known that not only myself, but the rest of the tenor section were hanging out at the club every Friday night. <laughs> but I was the activist, and so I had to take the fall for that. Um, and that hurts, you know, that hurts to be sort of excommunicated from a religious group. Um, many of you may know what that's like. I certainly know that many of my students know what that's like. Many of my students that I see in the Gender and LGBTQA Center are saying, my dad or my mom, you know, they're a religious leader in the community. Um, some are specifically, you know, ministers, preachers, et cetera. Um, my brother's in divinity school. What am I gonna do if I come out to him? I mean, these are serious issues. I have students saying things like, am I going to hell? I like to think that I'm not. I like to think that I'm nice, but I'm just not sure. These are the things that are so much broader than just the laws around marriage equality. So I want us to think about this um, because sometimes we like to put our eggs in the marriage equality basket, but there's a whole lot of other eggs out there. And with, um, with that, thanks. To all of you. Why don't, why don't we do it this way? I suspect some of you have questions or perhaps comments or observations. So why don't I just roam the room with the mic and you can ask our people anything that you like. All right. I see a hand, so here comes the roaming mic. Hi. Um, uh, pertaining to the um, difference between a legal marriage and a religious marriage, like, I understand that a church's specific um, beliefs can determine their religious um, marriage, like, practices. Like, you are free to, um, you are free to marry whoever you wish and, um, through your church. But why, what I don't understand is why that suddenly gives people the ability to infringe upon legal marriage. Because if, I guess, why, is there no distinction legally between those two? Because... Well, as Enrique said, there is a distinction, but in a way there really isn't. In other words, the, the church, because we, have, we are default officers, if you will, of, of the state to, 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 uh, to assign uh, these uh, marriage licenses, 
And then with this other proviso that we've learned about that um, now the state doesn't like come around with marriage police waiting to see if you do a religious marriage without a legal uh, binding obligation, but actually anyone who is attends one of those services that does not have a marriage license can actually sue. That's how the law works. I don't think they get more. I don't think they get more uh, damages than two hundred fifty dollars. I mean, it's some kind of weird little law. But but quite honestly, um, there is no incentive to do a particularly or uniquely religious marriage versus the legal marriage. What we say is when someone comes in is that you can get you can get married down at the city hall. Why do you want to be with us? What is it that you want from from us? And and if if you want this to have a religious component, then that we're going to add that religious component. But in terms of infringing, there is no infringement uh, in terms of a, a a religious organization can say I can't I decide not to marry you. But that's not where the marriage license comes from, and that's not where the legal marriage comes from. We only have the right to sign a document. That's all we can do. And and there have been people who've been uh, doing same-sex unions for years, and maybe those folks have felt very comfortable being in that kind of a covenantal setting, and that's how we've used it. But quite honestly, it's really been a very murky kind of relationship. Thank you. Others? <laughs> so I've, I'm ha if nobody has any questions, I'm happy to just point at something. <laughs> so unless you want that to happen. Well, I mean, I could, I, maybe, maybe this will encourage some. I thought, you know, Lynn's comment is really interesting. This One of her comments, the idea that why are same-sex couples so desirous of a type of union that the state has fought so hard to prevent them from having? You know, I, I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, I, I think one response is that there are a lot of other... Um, actions and decisions that happen as a result of how the state defines that union. And, and, and you don't have to be a, a, a lawyer to read just the facts of these cases. You know, lawyers who are working on constitutional law cases pick the best possible, most sympathetic plaintiffs um, that they can. And, you know, and, and when you read these big constitutional law cases, you know, Romer versus Evans, uh, e even the cases in the Supreme Court, you're talking about same-sex couples that have been together for decades. I mean, 30, 40, 50-year relationships. And, and, and the cases are about very mundane things like the estate of one of the parties. You know, you, you have these, these, these same-sex couples, same -sex couples who've been together for decades. One of them becomes terminally ill. They live in a state that, you know, before the Oberfeld decision didn't recognize uh, same-sex marriages, so they go to Canada or they go to New York, and they come back. So these cases are about whether or not you can visit somebody um, when they're terminally ill. How much of their estate are you going to be able to get when they die? You know, unfortunately, these, these issues turn uh, on whether or not um, there is a union there, a marriage that is recognized by state law. So uh, Matthew and Antonio is exactly right too. The idea that you know keep, we need to keep looking forward for the next thing, and a lot of these issues aren't matters of constitutional law at all. I mean, there are issues of contract law between employers and employees. There are issues of of state law or or, or even city law as to whether or not um, uh, uh, gay people are protected from discrimination, because in the overwhelming majority of cases they're not. So that's a political issue. That's an organizing issue. That's a lobbying issue. Um, you know, we talk a lot, and I like to think about um, the Constitution, but that really kind of scratches the surface of what this is about. I just want to follow up, um, so just so that we're clear. I, I do understand that why people want to get married. Um, and, you know, I um, have been with my partner for 12 years, and so the option to marry is, is empowering in a way. For me, the question, though, is um, what privileges does marriage afford couples over against single people? 
and why do we recognize some sorts of familial arrangements as privileged and others that aren't? Um, and so I think that that's one of the questions uh, for me and as someone um, who wants to think about um, not maybe being, um, having sort of the state regulate my relationships and um, life uh, in, in certain ways. I mean, it's, I, I just think, you know, I would sort of, when the issue of marriage equality came up as the issue that if you were a gay or lesbian person, you were going to embrace. I mean, there was a certain point a couple of years ago where you couldn't hardly talk about any other sort of issues. It had to be kind of marriage equality. That was the issue. Um, you know, issues of um, non-discrimination at work, issues of universal health care, um, which is beneficial for gays and lesbians and straight and trans people, um, all sorts of people. Um, I just think it, it's interesting that we chose marriage equality, which is um, marriage sort of this, wanting this sort of privilege in a way. Um, and I think um, as, again, someone sitting within a Christian tradition uh, where we're called to think about issues of equality, where we're um, in a tradition that does kind of challenge the priority of marriage, um, I think um, we have to think about that, you know, we may decide that marriage is the sort of the right option, but I think it, to, we have to be critical of it as an institution. So, um, so I, I came in a little late and I missed what you spoke about, but could, could you uh, address what marriage equality laws have to do with protected classes and whether that, has, that, that brings the community closer to So the, the reference to protected class is um, a reference to uh, uh, huge bodies of law on the federal and state level that say you cannot be discriminated against um, in X on the basis of Y. And X is, can be anything from employment to housing to public accommodation, which means anywhere that's open to the public. And Y is, the, is what we call protected classes. And every um, legal jurisdiction can define protected class how it wants, um, but most of the protected classes that all jurisdictions seem to protect are the ones that the question referred to. Um, sex, race, age, um, source of income is an interesting protected class with respect to housing, you know, discrimination that, that landlords can't discriminate. This is a very small, very kind of in the weeds example, but some, some cities say that landlords can't discriminate against you as a tenant on the basis of income. So they have to take it. They can't just say, you, we don't want you to live here because you're paying your rent with a Section 8 voucher um, that's given to you by the federal government rather than money. So the question is, does marriage equality affect all that? And, and it, a very cynical person who follows the Supreme Court would say that the Supreme Court uh, decided that there was a fundamental right to same-sex marriage because most people in the United States now, or very close to most people in the United States, seem to think that there should be a right to same-sex marriage. So in other words, the, the Supreme Court decides what the Constitution says based on what the polls say. And that's why in 1980 there was no right to you know, fundamental right to have sex with the person of your choice. In 2003, there was. So the, the same kind of momentum that has gone in the direction of same-sex marriage could easily go, um, you know, the, de defining sexual orientation as a protected class is probably going to ride that wave. Um, and, and I think that, that it's a wave that seems to, own, despite the Kim Davises of the world, seems to be going in one direction. And I, and I think there is, um, uh, you know, the, this protection, legal protection uh, on the basis of sexual orientation is something um, that, that, that we will see expanded drastically certain in the lifetime of, of the students that are in the audience. And I think, you know, Matthew Antonio made 
made this point, the idea that you know the actual legal protections um, for for uh, gay people outside of um, the constitutional right, which of course the Constitution only applies to the government, right? The Constitution doesn't apply to the baker. Um, so the actual legal protections outside of the context of the government um, that people um, that homosexual people enjoy is is much smaller, certainly as compared to people um, protections for people of discrimination on the basis of age or sex or gender. Um, but but that's definitely the direction in which things are moving. And I just want to say that even though when I spoke about a beginning, my hope and my prayer is is that more and more churches are going to open their doors to this. Now, they can't do it through the definition of protected class, but it wasn't that many decades ago that um, people wouldn't marry based on race, uh, interracial marriage, but now it seems that it's much more accepted. So my hope is is that churches will expand on this as well. So that's going to be not a legal uh, work, but that's going to be the work of the church working with it within the structures that we can, and hopefully even in the interfaith uh, understandings too, because we have so many different faith backgrounds now. So that's still a hope that we can become that as well. I, I just close by, you know, just tie a bow around it by saying pr a protected class is a statutory definition. And how do you change statutes? It's by organizing and convincing the people that write the statutes um, that those definitions should be changed. One last one, Ken Olson, Dr. Ken Olson. Um, I want to ask Professor Romeo especially. You suggested that eugenics might look at it that the Supreme Court is following popular opinion on this. So I'm wondering about is this also is popular opinion going to follow the Supreme Court? Once the Supreme Court has ruled that this is now the law of the land, will that accelerate popular opinion in accepting gay marriage? And I, I think it did that with desegregation. So there were certainly a lot of people at the time that were against desegregation. And you point to very, very few people who'd be willing to publicly say anything against it now. And does, does popular opinion follow the legal I think it's a virtuous circle. I think some of you might remember, you know, earlier this year there was this study that eventually got debunked where it, you know, some, something about you asked, you, you sent a, a, a pollster to somebody's house and you asked them how they felt about homosexuality and they said one thing and then the pollster kind of said, revealed that they were gay and then the person's opinion changed more in favor of, 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 of rights for gay people and it turned out this was completely bogus. But a lot of people believed it because they wanted to believe it, right? And, and, and I think once, it's, it seems natural to me that once people uh, meet more, uh, those people who might be resistant to giving equal rights to, 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 to gay folks, once they meet uh, married gay couples, and, and there will be more of those after this opinion, though not as many more as people think. You know, basically 30 states had already said you know, that they were going to permit um, same-sex marriage. But it's just like anything else. I think once you see that these, that these are um, functioning families and they're raising children the exact same way that opposite-sex couples do, um, and, and, then, and that those marriages have their problems in exact the same, exactly the same way as opposite-sex couples do, then I think that will create more political momentum towards the general idea that, um, that, 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 that sexual orientation should be a protected class, and that will result in more protection. Great. Thank you all for being here. The, our panelists are all available to you locally. If you have further questions or concerns you'd like to raise with them, uh, thanks for being here, and please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.